and welcome to this Green Sofa Dialogue. Today we'll be looking at offshore wind. We've titled this session today, An Offshore Wind of Change. And joining me for the discussion are Katrin Jung, she's the head of business unit offshore at Vattenfall, and Wukash Kolinsky. He's the head of unit renewables and energy system integration policy at the European Commission. Katrin Jung, Wukash Kolinsky, hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Hello, thanks for having us. Um, I'd like to get right into our conversation. We're talking about offshore wind. I want to know a little bit about how offshore wind can help deliver the European Green Deal. And more specifically, what is the current state of offshore wind energy? Katrin Jung, I'd like to ask you to address first. Yeah, it's a super interesting um, state because um, we have brought down costs a lot. We are now seeing the first projects that are built on the basis of market prices, so that don't need um, subsidies anymore. Um, and we see that a lot of countries are picking up on it. So it's, it's um, amazingly interesting across the board on a global scale. Um, yeah, now we only need to find the right sides, I would say. And Wukash Kolinsky, from your perspective, uh, what's the current state of offshore wind energy? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have currently around 15 gigawatts of, uh, uh, of offshore wind uh, capacity in the EU, another 11 gigawatts in the UK. So that means that we have more than 70% of the installed offshore wind capacity uh, worldwide in Europe. I think what's also important when we talk offshore is that over 90% of this European installed offshore capacity was produced in Europe. And European companies are global players in this offshore market. And uh, I understand that the industry employs overall in Europe 75,000 people. So it's a large industry. And there are, of course, many, many, many manufacturing sites um, across, across Europe for, for wind uh, components also in landlocked countries. So I guess we are in a good position in Europe. We have established technologies. We have the emerging technologies as well. The European Union is supporting both. And we can discuss uh, also the tools through which we support these technologies. All in all, I think it's a very exciting part of this renewable uh, uh, world that uh, that we want to develop here in the European Union. Since you brought them up, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about those tools? What are some of the some of the technologies that have been developed to support offshore wind energy? Yeah, uh, we have uh, the regular funds. Let's call them uh, regular because they do come uh, through the regular EU budget and think about structural funds, the cohesion fund through which one can support these projects. We have the recovery and Le resilience fund, which can support um, offshore wind technologies. And we have uh, also the research funding uh, where I believe we can give a very strong stimulus for the development of the emerging technologies such as, such as floating. Over the last 10 years, we have spent around half a billion euro on supporting research in the offshore wind uh, area. So uh, I think we can, we really have a number of tools to support the deployment and development of the offshore technologies across the EU. That's a lot about tools from the funding side. Uh, Katrin Jung, in your work in industry, what are some of the tools that you've developed? Yeah, we have come a long way when it comes to the size of the turbines, for example. We started off with um, very small sizes, as on in onshore as well, um, sizes like um, 300 kilowatt or 500 kilowatt. Now we are building turbines that are in the size of 12 um, megawatt each turbine. So that's um, a huge development. The plates have now a size that is as large as a football field. So it's unimaginable. You really need to go out to see it to really be able to, to grasp it. And that's a huge technology development, of course. And it brings a lot of advantages because 
you now need less foundations, you need less um, vessels to bring them out, you need less cabling, of course, and it's a lot more efficient when it comes to maintenance. So we have brought down costs from a level of 200 euros per megawatt hour, roughly, or maybe even more in the very early stages to levels um, below 50. Um, so yeah, quite, quite a long path to go. That's all fixed bottom still. Um, Mr. Kulinski also mentioned the floating. That would be a next stage to be able to then also use sites that are further out and that are deeper and where the wind yield can also be even, even larger. But that's then the, the next steps in the industry development. That actually is what I wanted to talk about next, uh, what, some, what some of these next steps might be. So you talked, uh, we're talking about market prices and subsidies aren't needed now for wind energy. Uh, what are the next steps that are needed or what's sort of holding back Europe uh, when it comes to offshore wind? Well, I, I mean, before we get to, to what's holding back obstacles, I think we also need to say a few words about where is the opportunity, why offshore wind has bright perspectives. And here you mentioned at the beginning the European Green Deal. If I may, I, I'd say a few words on this. Because, because uh, let's be very frank, offshore wind has been a European success story. The first offshore wind projects were in Europe. Today it's a mature large-scale technology with a strong European component on the one hand side. Then on the other hand side, we have the Green Deal with the climate neutrality of objective by 2050 and also with a very significant cut of emissions, 55% by 2030. In order to get there, we need to double our renewables share to 40% in this decade. And to get there, we need to employ all the renewable technologies, those more mature, like onshore, like solar, we need two and a half, up to three times more wind, or onshore wind and solar by 2030. But we also need to use the potential of offshore. What we see in our projections is that we will need five times more of offshore capacities than we see today. So there is a huge potential to, to scale up. There is a policy framework which brings predictability for investors. And we also have the offshore, European offshore renewable energy strategy adopted last year, where we set the objectives, 60 gigawatts installed of offshore wind by 2030 and as much as 300 gigawatts by 2050. So these are all opportunities. Now, you mentioned the obstacles and obviously there are, there are many that we see. I'd say, I, I'd mention uh, maritime spatial planning. It's of course a key prerequisite. We need to identify and use more sites for, for offshore across the EU. And that requires cooperation among the member states. It's always more difficult than the development of projects within one member state. We need good national legislation and we need legislation which will correctly implement the European rules which facilitate uh, the investments. We need efficient permitting procedures that will allow the, the project pipeline to materialize. And we also need to keep in mind those more innovative solutions like energy islands or, or hybrid projects or, or offshore hydrogen production. Um, we need to develop the grids, the offshore grids. Without this, our projects will be held back. There will be not um, no appropriate uh, infrastructure. And finally, I think we also need to look at the obstacles related to the industry in a sense of supply chain segments. Uh, are there any obstacles there? And finally, the skills. The skill challenge is high. And just to tell you that on these last two types of obstacles, we have now um, set a clean energy industrial forum and the offshore working group where we want to discuss with the industry how to overcome these barriers in particular. Katrin Jung, I saw you nodding your head here when we were talking about skill. Maybe you'd like to speak to that. Yes, um, if I start with the skill question, there is, of course, with that huge um, increase, a demand for skilled people. Um, we are trying to do as much as we can 
to go to schools and also get um, yeah, young people enthusiastic about the work, but it still needs to happen. So um, there's definitely a huge demand for um, skilled people in the future, uh, already at knocking at our doors, I would say. I, I also very much agree with the maritime spatial planning. I think that that is rightly the, the first step because that can lead us to the sites that are really um, bring us forward. At the moment, a lot of the space in the sea is claimed by other users because they were there first. Um, that's how it works. So, of course, there are shipping routes. Um, there is um, military space. There are um, sites that are um, used by, by fishery. There are nature reserves. And if we want to do it right, um, we, we, in my mind, need to have a look at how can we distribute the good sites again in a, in a good way? Because only that way we will be able to have also cost efficiency solutions and not then the space in the end that is maybe not, not so um, cost efficient anymore. And then I, I would like to mention one more area. Um, it goes a bit into the permitting site that was also mentioned by you, Mr. Kolinsky. But it's also from a, from a developer point of view, um, I, we, we, we come from a phase where a lot of the tenders have been postponed. And that continues to be the case. Um, there are hardly any tenders that happen when they have been announced to happen. Usually the tender rules take a bit longer, the permitting processes take a bit longer. And I usually say we are, we are pushing a wave in front of us because the member states in the EU will want to reach their renewables targets in 2030. And at the moment, I see that um, there's a lot, of, um, yeah, a lot of projects queuing up for the last years, for 29, 2030. And that will be um, a interesting phase for the suppliers, for the whole supply chain, but then also for um, vessel usage, for harbors, for, again, the skilled people. So, um, and that's not helping the industry too much if we have these um, very high peak activity levels in two, three years, and um, until then pushing things in front of us. So it, it is an area that we are looking at with a bit of um, yeah, concern from our side. Uh, Lukasz Kolinsi, please, I would love to hear, I saw you nodding, I would love to hear uh, a response from you here. No, I I did agree uh, simply on the on the permitting uh, challenge, uh, and and uh, we clearly see this as a as one of the obstacles not only for offshore for uh, for many renewable projects. Uh, what I can say is that um, one we would like to see the provisions that the Renewable Energy Directive, um, which was agreed in 2018 and was supposed to be transposed through the national legislations, we would like to see these provisions coming in force now. That, will, that should help, one. Uh, and second, we are also looking at these obstacles together with the stakeholders very closely, and we plan to come up next year with a guidance uh, on best practices across the EU in terms of permitting so that the projects can happen can happen more quickly. That sounds good. I wondered if we could get back to the question that I had about um, some of the other things that um, what we can do to then further unleash the power of offshore wind for Europe. I know that it's been a success in a couple of areas, but what's keeping us from making it a success elsewhere? Yeah. Um, I. Uh, I think at the moment, a lot of the countries have picked up on offshore wind. So I think it's starting to roll. Um, so I'm not so concerned that um, a lot is holding us back, but we have a long lead time. We have a lead time when we start a project, we have a lead time of some maybe eight years until we come into commissioning. If you go from the very early stage of identifying a site then doing the permitting, then doing a tendering, then doing a project specific um, permitting and then building. So the building in the end um, takes place within a year. So that's not the, the um, most time, time intensive part of it, but getting there takes very long. 
And that's what we're seeing right now. We have um, invested a lot of money, some of um, the countries quite intensively in the early stage when a lot of subsidies were needed. And now um, we are waiting for the fruits to really, um, yeah, for, for it to really bear fruits because it takes a while until we have the large amount of volumes in that we would really like to see. And then there are, um, the, I, I would mention the grid um, also as a, um, as a potential bottleneck because of course we have quite some industry, quite some demand sitting within um, continental Europe and um, those need to be delivered with the electricity that comes from shore at that point in time. And that's then the grid strengthening that is needed throughout the countries to really make it also usable for the demand um, within the, the countries. I would perhaps throw in one more thing into our discussion. Uh, offshore projects have this peculiarity that uh, they are in the sea basins and often they require uh, cooperation of a number of countries. And this regional cooperation, although, as Katrin said, it is picking up uh, together with increasing interest in offshore and together with the decreasing cost of offshore, I would still like to see more cooperation between the European member states in this area to sort out the obstacles that, that we have already mentioned, the obstacles related to maritime spatial planning, to obstacles related to permitting, uh, obstacles related to uh, grid uh, development. And I must say that <clears throat> we have the European and the regional cooperation fora, and I would like the member states to use these fora much more than before for the discussions and for the common development of offshore projects. Yeah, I can I can echo that from experience. We have one of our wind parks um, that is being connected to Denmark and to Germany via um, the transmission grid. And that was not an easy doing. It has been done by the transmission system operators, so not by us as a developer. But of course, we have been involved because it passes um, through our wind park. And um, it hasn't been easy at all to do that kind of connection. And it's only, it's only one line. So it's not a mesh grid. It's not an energy island connecting many countries. It's just a line that goes through um, two different wind parks from one country to the other. And already that was um, very intensive when it comes to regulation, finding um, solutions between the countries, between the permitting systems, um, also agreeing on how the renewable electricity will be counted for which country. So um, there, there are a lot of regulatory um, aspects that could be simplified a lot. Since you brought it up, do you have uh, solutions for that, how this regulatory um, process could be simplified? Yeah, to me it is um, a lot about simplifying, harmonizing the permitting processes because there, that's where it starts. If you have different permitting processes in different countries, you need to um, fulfill different regulation that makes it very complicated. And then um, there is a question around if you are a wind park developer that would like to participate in such a project, what, what is your benefit from it? If it's just a, a line passing through, there's not a lot of benefit for the wind park operator because the wind park operator would still be connected to the what we call home market, so to the original market. And that takes away the incentives for us to go for those solutions, because in the end, we might have more complexity, but no additional benefit. So that's, of course, a very subjective and very um, partial view, but um, it keeps us as developers from easily jumping on opportunities if we cannot see a monetary um, value from it. And what about investments in ports? What kind of investments do we need there to help support the growth of offshore wind? If I may, I mean, the way I see it is that ports, which uh, obviously uh, will play a key role in terms of uh, where the installation and maintenance of, of offshore wind parks will be run, they will need to, to expand their 
land, they will need to reinforce their keys, they will need to enhance their deep sea berths uh, and carry out all kinds of civil works. They will need to cater for a larger fleet if they want to service the offshore parks. And also for they need to prepare for the upcoming decommissioning projects or also for hosting manufacturing centers. And like I said before, it also applies here. The European Union has various types of support that can be used for all these activities, the Connecting Europe facility, the Recovery and Resilience facility, the structural funds or the InvestEU program. Yeah, from our side, we are usually welcomed um, quite a lot by the ports. At least that is my experience, that we usually meet a lot of interest because, of course, they would like to expand. Um, it requires usually a um, good pipeline, so um, an outlook on that there will be um, a stream of different projects being built because, of course, no port would um, do big investments just for one side. But in the areas that uh, we have been active, so in the North Sea, we um, usually meet quite some interest in um, ports rather wanting to support us and help with space than anything else. But it requires time. So there is also a lead time item in that. Mm -hmm. I want to stick with the, uh, the subject of ports for a minute. I've been reading in the news recently about how expensive energy and, and heating is going to be this year. And I was also recently reading, uh, someone mentioned hydrogen earlier. Um, and I was reading about blue hydrogen, how it's not, it's not, it's not uh, what we hope it's going to be. Um, and so the idea of ports and offshore wind energy uh, when it comes to green hydrogen. And so the role that ports are going to play in renewable hydrogen and then the links with other offshore wind uh, and its supply chain and other sectors. And I wanted to ask both of you, Katrin Jung, please go first um, to speak to that for a minute. Yeah, I believe in general the, um, the idea of um, hydrogen production is a very interesting one, well, very good one as well to combine with offshore wind because offshore wind is relatively steady compared to the other um, renewable production um, technologies. And then, of course, it's, it's obvious that um, using a harbor um, or a port makes sense because there is already an industry facility. There's usually still some space. Um, and then there, there can be a perfect fit here of um, building electrolyzers. There can also be opportunities to produce um, hydrogen offshore. So that will be an interesting um, technology development as well, which one will be more um, efficient, cost efficient. And there could actually also be a solution where you could use the um, hydrogen offshore. And of course, then the other interesting area is if you have a lot of big ships um, going out from the ports, they could be either electrified, so going with electricity if they have shorter distance, or they could use um, some kind of um, fuel made from hydrogen. So you could also directly use um, parts of the hydrogen again in the bigger ports. Absolutely. I must say that uh, I couldn't agree more. I would simply add that uh, production of, of hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, that's in the focus of, in the, focus of the European uh, strategy. In coastal areas that could also help relieve grid congestion, allow for faster uptake of, of the wind energy. And I think what is important is that ports are usually very well integrated into industrial ecosystems. And that can contribute to the uptake of, of renewable hydrogen. They are hubs, the ports are hubs where different modes of transport meet industrial installations. And this is where there is a concentration of those. And, and therefore, we, I believe that ports can serve as a dispatching hub for this renewable hydrogen being used as a fuel or being used as, as an energy carrier uh, for transforming, uh, for transforming the, the industry, the, the economy. And finally, I think, of course, ports can use this renewable hydrogen to, to decarbonize their own operations or serve local services, such as heating for industrial or waste and water, wastewater treatment. 
we're drawing to the end of our dialogue today, um, and I'd like to sort of pick up uh, Lukasz Kolinsky, what you were just talking about, about um, the role that it might play. Um, what role could offshore wind, and we're talking, let's talk a moment about, okay, what are our dreams or our wishes for the future? What role do you think that offshore wind could play when it comes to meeting not just Germany's, but Europe's sort of climate targets by 2030, 2050? So uh, I think we need to look at uh, the use of all available technologies that we have in order to bring down the emissions. And of course, the best way to bring down the emissions and also to expand renewables is electrification. But direct electrification is not possible. Everywhere there are applications, mainly in transport, think about heavy duty transport, think about aviation, and also in industry, think about high heat applications where this direct electrification is not feasible. And therefore, for these applications, we need to take steps to prepare for the uptake of renewable hydrogen. That, of course, will not happen today or tomorrow. This technology needs to be upscaled. We also need to solve the issues related to the fact that in order to produce this renewable hydrogen, you will need more renewable electricity. You don't want to bring in fossil fuel electricity online in order to produce this hydrogen. So hydrogen is a solution uh, that is necessary in those sectors where emissions are difficult to abate uh, through direct electrification, but it's necessary in view of the European objective of becoming climate, ne climate neutral by 2050. Thank you. Katrin Jung. Yeah, I like that you um, finished with the 2050 statement because that's what I have in mind as well. It's not um, 2030 is not a sharp end. It's not that we reach 2030 and then we, we are done, but then um, rather the real work starts. And um, that's what I have in mind that if we are, if we want to go to, <laughs> as we want to go to a fully decarbonized um, system, I, I usually say that um, it would be good to think from the end. And that means that the whole system needs to be able to, um, to keep up with a lot of wind in the system, meaning if there's the wind is blowing, there will be a lot of electricity. If there's no wind, there will be very little electricity. So what I see in front of me is also a much closer relationship between the offtake, be it industry or be it other uh, yeah, mobility or hydrogen and um, the fluctuating wind. And I think well, I hear as well that there is a lot more flexibility in industry processes that we can imagine right now, it, but it's a bit untapped because um, not all of the industry players um, feel that um, possibility of benefiting from the very low price hours. And I think that's where we can benefit more, also again from a wind park um, operator view, if we can um, work together more closely with off-takers in creating win-win situations where the off-takers can benefit from the low prices at the hours with a lot of wind. And that's where I see the, the big potential still um, and also the need to develop towards in a 2050 um, view. So the potential and also the need of what will happen by 2050. Um, I'd like to thank you both very much, Katrin Jung and Lukas Kolinsky, for joining me today. We'll see you at the next Green Sofa thank Dialogue. You. Bye. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Bye.